And I'm going to give an introduction to Travis Hume, who is going to be um, the moderator for this panel, and then he'll give introductions to everybody else. So I'm giving a introductory introduction or a meta introduction, and I'll, I'll give that while we're getting everybody else up here. So th this is the panel specifically about practical applications of Stoicism. Uh, Travis is the creator and administrator of the Applying Stoicism Project and its Facebook, Twitter, and Patreon social media accounts. The goal of the project is to help restore lost Stoic techniques and knowledge through lifelong writing, teaching, and application. Travis began practicing Stoicism 2012 early in his sophomore year of college and has been writing on it since. And one thing I'll say about Travis's writing is it's rather you, I won't say unique, but very interesting in that he only writes about the things that he's actually tried and either you know succeeded or failed or somewhere in between with, which I think is a very interesting um, rule for writing. He aims one day to, to be a full-time writer on Stoic philosophy and its implementation, fate willing. With that, I'm going to turn this over to Travis, who's going to introduce you to all the rest of our panelists and handle questions. Hi. Uh, so uh, thank you for that, Greg. Uh, you guys, everybody can hear me okay, right? Mic check, one, two. Okay. Yes. Uh, welcome to the uh, Practical Stoic Applications panel. Uh, thank you all for being here and singing around. Um, we'll start by introducing ourselves and a little about what Stoic projects we're working on and how we practice Stoicism daily. Uh, whenever one of us is finished, we'll pass the mic to someone that hasn't gone yet. Whenever one has, we'll pick questions out of the digital hat, so to speak, and discuss on it until it's either run its course or do account for time. I'll be watching for questions in the chat. If there are a lot, I'll be using a tool to grab one at random. I'll be restating the question. I'm happy to remind anyone what the question is, because sometimes, you know, it gets lost in the discussion. Um, but with that, I'll start. I'm Travis Hume, the creator and writer of the uh, Applying Socialism Life Project. You already heard about it. Um, the goal is to provide stoic guidance on some of the more difficult things to happen in life drawn from applied examples, such as navigating a broken family, uh, financial issues, health emergencies, and personal loss. So, you know, not heavy stuff at all. Uh, the, the project started in earnest as a uh, Facebook group, which I administered to date. Uh, prior to practicing stoicism in my sophomore year, I would describe myself as being fundamentally ruled by my emotions, uh, financial, romantic, and familial issues. I began learning about stoicism in a complete knowledge vacuum, uh, with my only being aware of Epictetus and the Enchiridion for about six to eight months, and only because of a 15-minute blurb in an intro to philosophy class I was required to take. Um, while I still have a great deal more to learn, I am in a leaps and bounds better psychological position than I once was. Uh, but that's enough about me hearing myself talk, um, so I will pass the uh, digital mic over to Eve. Hi, thanks, Travis. Um, so it's great to be here with all of you today. Um, so I work online globally as a stoic mentor and life coach. Um, I'm also an employment consultant and an autism specialist. Um, I do a few different things in stoicism. So I'm an advisor to the Aurelius Foundation um, at Modern Stoicism with Tim, as he was talking about earlier in his a really great workshop that he did. I've been doing um, Stoic Week um, this year and with Brittany and Amy, I'm doing Stoic Week for students. Um, like Brittany doesn't get enough of me, we're also doing Stoic Hair together. Um, what else do I do? I run London Stoics. Um, I think that's it in Stoicism. Um, I came to Stoicism myself, not as an academic at all. It was definitely a kind of sink or swim situation. I have um, a few different disabilities and illnesses that um, aren't treatable. And I think, I think if I didn't have Stoicism, then there was a, a big danger that my life might largely suck. And I wasn't wanting that. So... Um, I found something that was able to give me agency and mean that I could still live a good life. So I think that's what drives me in the work that I do with organizations and individuals is it's just a privilege to be on a journey with people where they can thrive, not only despite their challenging circumstances, but maybe even because of it. 
Um, and that's pretty magical. So yeah, that's that's why I love stoicism. Um, so shall I pass you on to Greg? Thank you. Um, I'm Greg Lopez, and I am the founder of New York City Stoics, um, a meetup group that you could still find on meetup.com today that um, is currently holding stuff online as well as in person. So even if you're from New York, you um, can still stop by if you'd like. I'm also the co-founder and board member of the Stoic Fellowship, whose goal is to build, foster, and connect Stoic uh, Stoics around the world by helping people build groups. And so if you're interested in finding a group or starting a Stoic group, you could check us out at stoicfellowship.com. I'm also co-author of um, A Handbook for New Stoics with Massimo Pigliucci, with whom I've collaborated also um, for Stoic Camp New York, which is on temporary hiatus until pandemic things settle down a little bit more, but we hope to get started soon again. Um, and also, I am currently working on some online courses, targeted practical online courses uh, that you could find at stoicmissingpieces.com. And I'm also collaborating with one other person on the panel um, on a possible follow-up um, to a handbook for new Stoics, but I'll let that person reveal themselves if they wish to say more about it and probably in a better position to say stuff about it than I am. Um, I got into Stoicism by volunteering for an organization that taught cognitive behavior therapy techniques to people with addictive behavior, smart recovery, and the specific form of cognitive behavior therapy they taught, rational motive behavior therapy, somebody else on the panel is very much more familiar with it than I am, Walter. Um, but that led me to stoicism and led me to all of the stoic stuff that I currently do. I also um, practice Buddhism, primarily secular early forms with um, akin to maybe Thai forest tradition techniques, and I'm happy to take questions about that as well. But that's me in a nutshell. With that, I will pass it on to the next person on my screen, which is Walter. Hi, um, my name is Walter Matwichuk. I'm a clinical psychologist by training, but I practice mainly uh, psychotherapy. I practice a form of psychotherapy that's an amalgamation of ancient and modern philosophy, which heavily borrows from Stoicism. It's called Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy, and I had the good fortune of studying with Albert Ellis, who originated it. I would, I also uh, teach graduate students and train clinical psychotherapists in the art and practice of psychotherapy. I do some writing both for the professional audience and for the lay audience. I would say my mission or my project, if you will, is the dissemination of uh, rationally emotive behavior therapy and the support of stoicism. I think they're a little bit like gin and tonic. They go together nicely. And um, I do this through my weekly Rationally Emotive Behavioral Conversation Hour that's held at 9 a.m. Eastern, where I take a volunteer and do actually have a 45-minute conversation with them as to how they could apply both REBT and the ideas of uh, Stoicism to their life and their real problem. It's not a role play. And I also give away the information of REBT, which, like I said, closely parallels Stoicism through uh, what I call the intermittent reinforcement email uh, message that I send out almost weekly, and my website, rebtdoctor.com. So I'm really interested in disseminating ideas that I think help people cope with uh, difficulty. I like to say that I give them a shield and a sword, not a sweater. And um, to me, life can be very hard and the pandemic has borne that out. So that's me. Hey, everybody. My name is Karen Duffy, and I'm a writer, producer, and actor. And the gods of fun have really smiled on me because yesterday I gave, a, I was on a panel at the New York City Comic Con talking about Dumb and Dumber. And today I'm at Stoicon with all you beautiful, brilliant people. Um, very similar to what Eve said, um, I found myself deeply attracted to uh, the principles of Stoicism when I was facing a health crisis as well. And I found uh, Stoicism to be an amazing framework. So my life doesn't suck. I have a great life, even though I live with complex regional pain syndrome. And um, I've written three books that really kind of focus on stoicism and uh, model patient backbone. And I have a new book coming out called Wise Up in uh, April uh, of the next year. Meredith. Sarah, thank you. 
glad to be with you all today. Uh, my name is Meredith Alexander Kuhns, and uh, I'm the author of the Stoic Mom blog. I launched that in 2016 to share ideas about uh, Stoic concepts and Stoic life philosophy with parents and caregivers, and I've been working on that ever since. Um, I also write about modern Stoicism for the Stoic magazine, which is published monthly by the Stoic Gym, um, and I'm one of the admins um, for the Stoics Parents uh, Facebook group. Uh, just kind of a little bit of background. Um, I'm also a, a writer and a communicator professionally in the tech industry in Silicon Valley. I live in Northern California. Um, and my real job is a parent to two teenage daughters. Um, so that's kind of what led me to Stoicism. Before I discovered Stoicism in around 2015, I was struggling with a lot of anxiety around just uh, all the expectations about being a perfect mother and wife and daughter and friend and professional and every role that I felt I was supposed to live up to, but was, was struggling with that idea, um, wanting to raise my two girls to have good values and a uh, good way of living and support a you know healthy home home experience with my husband, uh, pursuing my career at the same time. It just felt that every choice was loaded with a lot of anxiety, producing questions and pressures. And um, it was it was just tough. So uh, I realized I was spending a lot of time focusing on things that were outside my control. And what helped me see that was stoicism. So uh, knowing that there was this age old philosophy that could kind of set things uh, in balance and could really actually reinforce the perspective I already brought to my parenting and to my work was, was an amazing discovery for me um, that pulled towards the superficial vision of status and success and everything that we're being taught. Um, kind of this, this counterpoint to that was, was really remarkable. And I also wanted to use that as a way to empower my children to become independent guides for themselves. So guiding them, but also helping them to see how they could learn to really take this on, um, knowing that, you know, we cannot control anyone else, even as, as a parent, of course, it, it's liberating, it's empowering, and I, I feel that it's it's critical. Um, so I, sh I share this with my, my daughters and with other uh, students I volunteer with. Uh, and um, right now I'm currently working on a longer writing project about stoicism for teens with two co-authors, in including Greg, who uh, mentioned it obliquely there. And I think teens today are under incredible stress. Um, and this has been exacerbated by the pandemic and the growth of social media. And we're seeing new information coming out about this every single day. Uh, research is showing the mental health challenges for our young people, teens and kids. It's, it's just rising to really severe levels. So I think we need to give them more tools for coping and thriving at the same time giving that to, to parents. So I continue to write for caregivers and parents uh, about how I work with my family and my kids and my volunteer work in the Stoic Mom blog. I invite you to check it out. Um, and I also, uh, I, I tweet sometimes as, as the Stoic woman. Um, and I'd love to also build a, a, a book or resource about Stoic inspired parenting and caregiving and including reflections and, and wisdom because I think everyone who's in this boat sees uh, how tough it can be. So thank you for having me. Uh, Kevin. Well, thank you, Meredith. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Uh, like some of our previous panelists, I was drawn to the Stoics through the uh, rationally Motive and Cognitive Therapists, people like Albert Ellis and, and Aaron Beck. That was about 40 years ago when I was an undergraduate in psychology. And, and during those years, I, I retired now from uh, a full-time career in disability adjudication and a part-time career as a psych, uh, psychology professor for various colleges uh, and universities. I've written 20-some books on psychology, philosophy, theology, even physical fitness, and almost all of them draw, at least to some degree, bring in some Stoic insights. I've written one book specifically about the Stoics called The Porch and the Cross, and my goal there was to try to show Christian readers how valuable Stoic ethical uh, insights can be to them. But I'm really excited just to tell you about a new project online now that it kind of ties in a little bit with, with uh, Greg and uh, Meredith, the, the book mentioned earlier, because it may have special interest for introducing children and adolescents to Stoicism, and because it also ties into my specialty area in psychology, which was human memory. 
I did a master's thesis on memory strategy, memory instruction, mnemonic techniques in helping adolescents uh, learn better, learn academic material better. And my doctoral dissertation and internship work was at an Alzheimer's center at a medical school. Uh, so I looked at the other end of what happens to our cognitive functioning and memory as we age. And, and for some of us, unfortunately, as we develop dementia. But anyway, th this new book is to be called uh, Memorize the Stoics, the Ancient uh, art of memory meets the timeless art of living. And this book will be a, a practical tutorial through which if readers follow through, it, it's illustrated, it uses simple visual imagery, but if readers follow through, they'll realize they can re remember in their exact order, a key point from each of the 53 uh, chapters of Epictetus's handbook. We do the same thing with the Seneca's first letters and give you one example of how simple this can be. And then I'll, and then I'll shut up. Uh, Imagine you come to my house, you open my front door. This is location number one. The door opens and you see the inside of a jet's cockpit and your eyes zoom in on this control panel. What's the control panel doing inside my front door? Well, that's just to remind us it's in that first chapter of the entry that introduces the dichotomy of control. And if you wanna make it one better, imagine that jet was James Stockdale's jet. So we can tie in the modern application since Alder just talked about him. So anyway, uh, I love stoicism it incorporated in most of my work and just happy to be here with you all today. Hi, thank you, Kevin. Uh, we have our uh, first question. Um, each of us should try to give a example, a real world example of how we've applied stoicism. Uh, so for, for me, for example, um, not terribly long ago, uh, my wife had COVID and she had uh, stroke symptoms and it was very rapid. Um, she wasn't able to speak to me suddenly after exercising. And she, at first I thought, you know, she was messing with me <laughs> and uh, it became very clear uh, when she lost a uh, feeling in uh, her limbs and couldn't talk properly that something was was wrong um, so i got her dressed and we went to the hospital and in those you can't prepare for a situation like that um, epictetus describes it as being paired suddenly with a uh, competitor that is way stronger than you and uh and way bigger and you have in that moment the the option to try to see to try to draw as much constructiveness out of a severe negative situation like that as you can that the window is incredibly small to do that whether you allow this situation to kind of take control of your mind um, or if you approach it correctly if you approach it correctly nobody can take that away from you no matter what um, so we, i was able to hold it together um, she's fine now she's everything is is okay just you know so everybody knows um, but that was definitely probably one of the biggest, well, it's definitely one of the biggest tests of my life. And I'll just leave the floor open to anyone that wants to go next. I am um, 31 years ago, after I had completed my training with Ellis, I was a week away from my oral dissertation and I found myself at happy hour sitting on a jukebox. And um, I was watching somebody go around pilfering beer from other people's pitchers. And this rather large man, probably uh, would make Greg Lopez look small, um, eventually made his way to my pitcher. And I grabbed his, I stupidly grabbed his wrist and said, that's not yours. And this man who was huge looked down the end of his arm at me and spit in my face. And with that, I took my glasses off wiped them on my um, jeans and walked out of the bar and said to myself, dirty water. So I think that um, illustrates my ability to use the dichotomy of control um, because I think that was not the uh, response that this gentleman was anticipating coming from me. And I've used the, I, at the time, never knew the legs I would get from that story, but it's, um, I've used it many, many times to teach the principle of emotional responsibility, which is that when a patient tells me that their wife made them angry, I say, no, 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 no. You angered yourself about what she did or did not do. So that's my stoic story. 
I can bring up an example that's a little relevant to um, uh, Aldo's talk um, that happened right before this, which is kind of applying role ethics, which is kind of my main mode of practice now. And it's kind of a daily life thing. It's not necessarily formal. So when I find myself wandering off from the role I find myself in, I find it useful to try to remind myself what my role is and then act in accordance with it. And this is very broad ranging as roles shift throughout the day. So for instance, if I'm working, part of the job description is not go to Reddit and take a look at explain like I'm five. Um, that's not <laughs> in my job description. So that reminds me to get back on track. If I'm with a family member and I wanted to come to socialize, but yet I find their attitudes or stories not necessarily interesting and I start getting bored or something, I'm like, I'm here to socialize as a family member. And if I'm frustrated in line, my role is as a person, who, customer who's waiting in line. And so that's all I should be doing. So by remembering my role in each situation, when I start wandering off, I find that I can sometimes um, successfully bring myself back. And um, Eve, um, you had mentioned before a little bit about uh, life being rough. Do you mind uh, extrapolating on that a little bit? <laughs> bring, 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 the, uh, bring, the, bring the mood down by uh, talking about sad things. What do you yeah, mean? The mood I is mean... way up. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think um, it's been challenging as well um, during COVID for me because I can't socially distance because I'm almost completely blind. And so I can't like tell how far away I am from people. So I lost a lot of my, my mobility, I think during COVID. And I'm having to um, gradually, now more people are vaccinated. I'm having to learn to go out again on my own when I've barely been out of the house on my own at all since um, March of last year. And I can feel all the anxiety of doing that because I think you kind of lose your confidence. And um, yeah, it's a, that's again when stoicism is really useful to me, where you can say to yourself, well, the wise thing, you know, what is my job as a human? I'm a rational social being. I need to be out doing the work of being a human being and, and connecting with others. And I'm not going to I mean, I am connecting with you being at home here, but I can't actually stay in the house on my own forever. So I need to find um, the courage to be able to leave the house, you know, even when I do feel anxious. Um, and so, yeah, I think I think during um, COVID, as it has been my whole life, I think it's it's just given me the ability to rise above my circumstances. And even when I'm feeling scared realize it's not about me take that view from above look at the bigger picture and think you know how am i able to connect with my community so yeah it's uh you know it just makes the difference doesn't it really does anyone else want to uh contribute um i probably the most profound few words were from Epictetus that really reverberate through me like a firecracker in a symbol in a silverware factory. And that is Epictetus when he says, and if you want to, if you want to make a beautiful life, make beautiful choices. And I find the simplicity in, in this idea of every, you know, we make, I think it's about between 30 and 40,000 decisions a day. Most of them are intuitive or reflexive, reflective. But the ones that take thought, I always have Epictetus in my heart thinking, you know, make the best choice. And uh, as Marcus Aurelius said, you know, if you want to feel good, do good. So part of my daily life is every day I write a thank you letter to somebody in the world. And it's not an email and it doesn't have my return address because it's not about reciprocity. It's just about saying good on you to somebody. And I've been doing that for 30 years and I'd say it worked. I could speak for a moment. Um, and thank you for that. By the way, that was uh, inspiring to me too. Um, th mine was just about COVID and the pandemic and um, my family situation. Uh, I was fortunate that none of my immediate family did become sick, but um, my two children were really affected by this because their schools were completely shut down. Uh, and one of them did not go to class. 
you know, from uh, March 2020 until this August. Uh, so uh, the other one had just starts, you know, a little bit before that. And basically, it was just a tons of frustrations from them, tons of um, stresses and worries about uh, how are they going to cope with this online school situation? How could they see their friends? Could you know? Would they get sick if they went out? What would what would we do to get groceries and toilet paper? Um, and I think that took a lot of stoic mentality to to try to get through it and just provide that support for them with their online learning. You know, be a supplemental teacher for them. Reach out to the administration, which honestly wasn't always you know all that helpful, and and strategize with them. Then okay, you're not going to get that help. Your teacher has this expectations. How are you going to work through this moment to moment and just kind of stay present in what you need to do and do the best you can. And one thing I love about stoic thinking is it's really about just doing the best you can in the moment that you have. And that I think can be inspiring for anyone of any age uh, to kind of just keep going and remember the things that you are doing well and the things that you are accomplishing. Now there's anxiety about going back to school. This back to school season uh, has been, I frankly, not that easy for a lot of people, including me, and uh, have to tamp down the worry that, you know, maybe my kids will get COVID. We get exposure notices each week about COVID in their, their schools. Um, and uh, it's, um, it's an interesting situation. I know throughout the country and throughout the world, there's, you know, we have a lot to be grateful for, but I would say that there's tough tough situations, not just with the virus, but also with uh, with social situations, readjusting, you know, how do they relate to their peers? Um, So I'd say it takes a daily dose of stoic thinking uh, to be to be a caregiver today, as well as maintaining all the other things in our lives that we're trying to do, like, for example, our our other jobs uh, outside of uh, being a family and caregiving person. There is uh, two different questions that I'm going to uh, combine together uh, for time. Um, What are your approaches or what would be your approach if you are working with individuals with uh, behavioral uh, concerns, mental illnesses, or special needs? Uh, I have some direct experience with this working in a behavioral school and with uh, special needs classrooms. Um, I've, I've been bitten. I've had iPads thrown full force into my head. Um, I've been headbutted. I've been outnumbered with like, uh, screaming, you know, uh, screaming kids that are almost as big as I am <laughs> They're all trying to take each other out. You know, um, the, the best thing that you can do is to try to model your behavior and with enough time, if you are approaching things in a stoic way they they will have a chance of modeling their behavior after yours um it's not immediate it it's not easy um because in a, in a lot of situations there is there is a gap uh where social cues are are not sufficient um so they they watch your body language um they are mindful of what you say to the degree that they can be and if you are exhibiting uh, philosophically consistent actions, they, they will improve. Um, they are able to assess why you're doing it. Um, it, it's possibly in a limited capacity, but they can, and I will leave the floor open for the rest. Yeah, if, if I could, yeah, I might just mention too, kind of the other end of the lifespan. If you're in a situation where you're dealing with an older person who's maybe dealing with some kind of uh, cognitive decline or dementia, you know, we might bear in mind one of the fundamental stoic lessons is we're not going to blame other people. You know, what they're doing somehow makes sense to them, and at this stage in life, it may be hard for them to make sense of the reality that's out there in and of itself, especially if they become paranoid and so far. So at that point, you know, we need to focus on the control of our own emotions and not suffering too, too much if they insult us. You know, many of the Stoics talk, talk wonderfully about bearing insults graciously, though it's not easy to do, but it's something we want to keep in mind if we exercise that, that other aspect of Stoicism, which is getting so much, so much, uh, actually press now, we're talking about for, for good reason, which is those positive caring, what I think Sharon called the, the we virtues. If we're going to practice those with others, if we're going to show them care, even though they're insulting us, that's where stoicism can help buttress us so we're not going to get unduly upset and allow us then to reach out to do things for them, 
even knowing you know we, we may suffer some kind of uh, retribution for it. Thanks, Kevin. It reminds me of Marcus Aurelius. He said, like, you know, again, he's fighting enemies and assassins, but he said, you know, the best way to deal with an adversary is to not be like them. And so kind of what Travis was saying and Kevin, it's to, you know, uh, be aware of our own control. And I think this also harkens back a little bit to uh, Brittany's talk earlier about cognitive compassion. Um, when I find myself in personal interaction with, with uh, people, it tends to be more like what Kevin discussed about older people with um, cognitive decline issues. Um, then I try to imagine what kind of experience they're having and they're, often their actions make a lot more sense and that naturally uh, allows me to accept things a little uh, more smoothly and also act to the best of my ability in the, given the situation. Yeah, I think that's really true, Greg, and it, it does relate to what Brittany was saying about the kind of emotional contagion aspect of caring for people who are struggling or working with people that are struggling, that, that the wise thing is to be able to have that con cognitive empathy without actually getting on board with the emotion that the other person is feeling, um, because, you know, then you're, you're less able to help them. It's that old you know, put your own oxygen mask on first. You need to take good care of yourself in order to be able to care appropriately for others. Awesome. Uh, so there is a very good question uh, that we can touch on that was from the uh, questions that we received initially when we first put the word out about Stoicon. Um, How do ongoing disruptions to life and business due to COVID provide opportunities to build resiliency or can they? And I'll just, le just leave the floor open for this one. I would kind of say that in my experience, it was a little more of a test of what I already did rather than a opportunity in the moment. So in Stoic practice, I don't know, and I think the ancient Stoics would also agree that if you're in the midst of what they call a passion, which is a subset of emotions that push reason to the side and make you turn against your fellow human beings, then by definition, you kind of can't reason yourself through it because a passion pushes reason to the side. But it was interesting. I had a talk with my main employer when the pandemic started about possibly taking a massive salary cut. And after like a couple of moments, because of possible uncertainty, and um, I was surprised, I was almost surprised that the automatic thought that popped up in my mind was, oh, good, this is an opportunity for me to cut back on the crap I'm <laughs> spending my money on currently. Um, and I, then I was surprised by that response. But that told me that the preparatory practice of trying to remember practice, rehearse, and digest Stoic principles when things are going well helped me in that moment. And I cross my fingers, hope that in future difficulties it can happen. But the main thing I would say is that um, practicing beforehand for these kinds of things could be particularly useful. I, I would say that, uh, and I, I agree with Greg on this, um, sometimes I think back to that uh, concept that in Stoicism, we're trying to maximize our agency. Um, I think this came from Lawrence Becker. And I, I think that's really important here because even in a situation where we feel we have no choices, there really are choices that we do still have. Um, and in this pandemic, we've all confronted, you know, so many limitations. Um, and uh, I think what we, there's always things we still can do. I mean, for example, you know, wearing a mask, practicing hygiene, supporting other people with their families, um, you know, when you're going to the grocery store, you're keeping your distance. The things that we all kind of just had to adjust to doing are just minor things. But if everyone does those things, then it really creates a better situation for everyone uh, in a in a in a tough time. And it, it that kind of that that mind shift uh, of what we can do. The other thing I was just going to say is um, one thing I try to do in in my caregiving and in my family relationships is attempt to be a non-anxious presence. Sorry, okay, a non-anxious presence as 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 a mom. And it, it, it's a challenge for me. A lot of times I try to use my stoic concepts as kind of an antidote to some of my more natural uh, instincts. And But in this pandemic, that was really critical because I think especially um, if you're working with kids or if you have kids or volunteering with kids, they they will, as I think you were mentioning before, Travis, you know, they'll, they'll sense when you think something is like truly catastrophic or really stressful or really bad. 
Um, so I think kind of being that that rock when you can and that voice of reason um, can make a huge difference for those those around us in these trying times. I think the pandemic has given uh, me an opportunity to remind people of what I call unconditional life acceptance. Um, a pandemic is statistically unlikely. It's an adversity that occurs infrequently. And so people will tend to say, you know, it shouldn't happen. But in fact, pandemics are part of life. And it would be, we'd be well advised to see that all the conditions were in place for this event to occur. We might not know what those uh, conditions were, but we can at least practice, again, controlling our reaction to them. And I, I believe it was Seneca who said something like he pities the individual who has not been tested. Um, and so I think that I'm better um, for having lived through this pandemic. I, am, I, I truly believe that. And it has given me the opportunity to be creative insofar as I don't think I would have ever thought of having, I don't think I ever would have had thought of the idea of doing a weekly session to anybody in the world if it had on Zoom, if it hadn't been for the fact that a pandemic occurred. And then it occurred to me, like, why not help people where you can, where they are. So there's advantages, uh, there's, there are hidden benefits within the pandemic. I think that's so true because um, I think one of the main things of stoicism for me is about seeing the world as it really is. And I think possibly before the pandemic, people were confused even more about what's important and what really matters. And one of the things you know, for those of us who've had family members that unfortunately have been seriously affected or, you know, for all the people that have been struggling because of the changes, I think it's really made people have gratitude for what really matters. It has made people realise about the importance of connecting with our communities and treating people within our communities as if they're like our family, you know, people going out and shopping for elderly people who couldn't get to the shops, you know, all those kind of things. I think it's really made people think about, you know, what matters, being a good person, and also um, being prepared to look at things differently, um, which is a gift, isn't it? And then for some of us, um, there's been opportunities as well. It's that, old, you know, the obstacle is the way. We wouldn't necessarily... Um, be doing so many things online and that's created new opportunities within the stoic community for example which is a massive gift here we are connecting you know and that partly has come out of the pandemic so I really agree with you and it also has reinforced the idea that it's it's one world that a person mm -hmm. on the other side of the world is a brother and we need to be concerned about their well-being because their problem ultimately may impact people throughout the world awesome thank you for that uh what advice would you give to someone that wants to start practicing stoicism for the benefits it entails but doesn't know where or how to start or what with start with the dichotomy of control start asking yourself, what is it that's within my power to control and what's outside of my power and start with your attitude towards the reality as you perceive it. That single idea will get you going uh, quite far. Also, Stoic Week is coming up um, in just a couple of weeks, and that's a guided um, one week long way to start. And uh, recently, uh, Eve has also, um, and some others have put together uh, Stoic Week specifically for teens and possibly children. Perhaps you could speak more about that, but that's just in over a week, and it's a guided great place to start. Yeah, we've been working really hard on all of this. And, um, and, uh, Stoic Week itself, like Tim was saying, we're going to record it as well, because I was thinking, I mean, obviously, I, I can't really read books. Um, but also, like a lot of you, I'm really super busy. And I was thinking about how much I listen to podcasts or YouTube or whatever. And so we thought we'd do Stoic Week. So you could also listen to it while you were doing the washing up, if that's all you can fit in. Um, and then we've done Stoic Week for students, because I think a lot of us who our parents or teachers or mentors 
Um, it's just such a great idea to have material accessible and relatable for young people. So we've been working really hard on that. The other thing I was going to pick up on, and this relates to you, Greg, is that um, I think if you're new to Stoicism, my biggest recommendation would be to see if you can join a group or start a group. And these days, because a lot of the groups have kind of had to go online, you can even go to a group that's not right near you locally if it's in the right time zone. Like connect because we're all like a stoic family and, you know, you can share your experiences or you can go, oh, God, I'm still really struggling with like losing my temper or whatever. And I don't think people will judge you. They'll say, oh, have you tried reading this? Have you tried practicing like that? You know, and I've just had so much um, love and support from the Stoic community over the last year or so. And I'm so grateful for that. So yeah, reach out, I think. Yeah, and if I could offer too, as, as a bookworm and author, for those who are reading books, I'm, and if you're new to Stoicism, I might suggest, you know, go pick out a modern book, a nice little summary. There's so many good ones out there. Many of the people here with us today have written them. Get one of those. And then also go back to one of the originals, Epictetus' tiny little handbook or, or a book on some of Seneca's letters or Marcus Aurelius' meditation. So, so get a modern take on where this all fits in and get a little taste of the Stoics themselves. And I think that can, can give a good start. So good. You know, the great thing is education is so generous with free libraries, Stoicon, Stoic Week, online courses, but it seems like the desire to learn is stingy. So we just have so much happening. And I mean, just reading the books of the panelists and the speakers today have really just lit the fuse and have just carried me away. So yeah, it's an embarrassment of riches. And Meredith, what are your thoughts on it? I would just, I was just going to echo that it, we're really fortunate that we can connect online in these ways um, and learn from each other. Because um, I, I go back to my Marcus Aurelius and Epictetus, you know, frequently, but it's hearing from real people about their real experiences that helps me learn how to put Stoicism into practice. So I, I love events like this and the Stoicon X events. Um, there's a lot of great things, uh, even on Facebook groups and on um, some of the YouTube channels and people here who've been speaking and featured today are sharing a lot, um, blogs and podcasts, and there's just more and more information about how stoicism is relevant to our lives. So I guess I would almost say, think about how you want to apply it in what sort of role and what sort of uh, angle that it will help you the most to start off with and maybe look for some materials around that specific uh, introductory sense. Awesome. Uh, so in, in my personal experience, uh, I, I had very little knowledge about who Epictetus was. Um, I had a like two to three paragraphs that roughly explained what period he lived in um, or who he was. I thought that when he was referred to as a Stoic, that it was it was just him, like just this one guy that was, you know, coming up with the stuff that he was talking about, like a one off type thing. Um, so I accidentally became aware of like Marcus Aurelius and Seneca and all that uh, much later. Um, in fact, I got Epicurus confused with Epictetus. For some reason, I fixated <laughs> on the idea that Epicurus was just like a, a fancy nickname for Epictetus or just a different way to translate his name. Uh, so I was pretty rough to begin with, um, but the the way that I had taught myself haphazardly to learn this stuff was to try to take sentences or paragraphs from the handbook, um, which is a short form of the discourses, try to identify specific daily situations, common situations um, where I apologize, there's a Sorry, there was a mild technical issue there. Something was uh, trying to update um, specific situations where you could apply those sentences and um, and uh, just try to s imagine what a, if you were Marcus Aurelius or Epictetus or whomever, how would you react to that situation then to try to actually think that way and mess up like you're going to mess up. It's it's 100 percent OK if you completely botch your emotional response to a situation at first that is going to happen over and over until slowly over time you are 
becoming more cognizant of what you are thinking and feeling, why you're feeling it and when. And then you can slowly identify uh, the very quick and almost like quasi instant process that happens when you're confronted with the situation, which is like first movement where you have like a non-voluntary response to a thing where your brain is like, okay, this thing is happening and this is bad. And then your brain then processes it into a proposition, which is something that it can understand uh, in your own language, uh, which you can identify. And then there's the ascent that happens after that, which is do I in fact agree with what my five senses are telling me and the fact that it's bad. And if you can make it pause for just a few seconds, you can then be in a better position where you can respond to it properly or at least at least try. The trying is also important. So